Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we thank you for bringing us together this evening to hear your word, to letting us find the time to uh, come together. We thank you for Parveen who will share your word with us. Please guide and direct him. Help us, help each one of us to understand and to do your will. In Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Vanessa. Let me face up my screen. Okay. Uh, as you all know that uh, we have started uh, a series on the life and uh, theology of Paul. Paul and his theology and uh, we have studied about his life, we have studied about uh, uh, his theology and greatest uh, uh, Old Testament uh, images he brought and uh, the theological themes also we have studied. Uh, for this evening we will be studying about Christology of Apostle Paul. Uh, we, find about, we find Christology all over the uh, New Testament. And uh, especially we find the Christology from uh, two people only, and that is for, from Apostle Paul and then uh, uh, by Apostle John. What is Christology? Christology is nothing but study of Christ, studying about the nature and character of uh, Jesus Christ, primarily studying about who Jesus Christ is. That is what Christology is. Many Christians do think that Christology is only one particular subject and there is only one perspective towards Christology. But in the early church itself, we can find there are two kinds of Christologies. One is called high Christology. Number two is called low Christology. High Christology is something that we are still believing. And many of uh, Christian cults they accepted and they they believe in the low Christology. Of course, you may be wondering why am I saying high Christology, low Christology without explaining, but I'm going to do that right now. High Christology is talking about especially the divinity of Jesus Christ and high Christology speaks about pre-existence of Jesus Christ before the incarnation. In other words, the existence of the second person of the Trinity before the incarnation. We can find that in the writings of Apostle Paul and then Apostle John. The remaining apostles did not touch much about uh, the high Christology or um, they did not touch much about uh, the divinity of Jesus. But uh, you know, Apostle John and Apostle Pete, uh, Paul, sorry, Apostle Paul, they have written extensively and they have written quite a bit uh, about the divinity of Jesus Christ and the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. We all know John chapter 1 verse 1. John says, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And at the same John uh, also quotes uh, the uh, statements of Jesus where he says, before Abraham was I am. So, which is talking about the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. This is what high Christology is about. And another person who have written very much about uh, uh, high Christology uh, is Apostle Paul. Um, we can, in fact, we can find more Apostle Paul writing and speaking about high Christology more than any others. One example we can, we can find that is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 19. This has been used as the doxology of the church for so many years. Even today, many people use it for doxology. Uh, doxology is actually, doxa means opinion, otherwise uh, speaking glory about somebody. Okay, these are the words which were used to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in the worship. So the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 19, it's writing, uh, Apostle Paul is writing about Jesus and he says, He is the image of the invisible God, <coughs> the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, 
This reminds us about again what Apostle John said. All things are created uh, through him and there is nothing that was created without him. And then Apostle Paul says, uh, all things, uh, sorry, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. See, look, you can see such a, a great uh, doxology it is. You can see the imp uh, intensity of these words. We can see how Apostle Paul is looking at Jesus, how highly he is talking about him. He is the exact image of the Father. And he is the firstborn of all of all creation. He is above all. In fact, all things are created in Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus. And all things, the purpose of all things is in Jesus. That's what he meant when he says all things are created for him. You are created for him. I am created for him. The earth is created for him. Everything that is existing either visible or invisible, whether the powers or the thrones, whatever they are, all these things are created for Jesus. In other words, to say the, pur the purpose of everything that is created is Jesus Christ. And he is in all things. He is over all things. And in him, all things consist. So can we see the greatness of Jesus Christ? Can we see the preeminence? Preeminence means he is into everything and he is above everything. So that's what Apostle Paul writes about Jesus Christ. This is what we call high Christology. What we see in the creeds, the Nicene Creed says he is the God of God, light of light, true God of true God. He was begotten, not created. And he is before all things. He is the true God from God. That's what Apostle Paul also was writing in Colossians. So this is, high, this is about high Christology. What is low Christology? There are, so, as I told you previously, there are so many Christian cults who have uh, subs subscribed to this uh, theological uh, understanding of Christ. Low Christology says that Jesus was a human and he was ad adopted as the son of God. Jehovah Witnesses, Jesus was the first creation and he is the greatest creation. And uh, uh, there is another group called Adoptionists. They say Jesus was just a human. At the, during his baptism, he was adopted as his, uh, adopted as son of God. So these are the words so many people say this is called low Christology and uh, no Christian or uh, no Orthodox Christians do believe it. Orthodox Christians believe that we are believing the son who is co-eternal with God, co-existing with God and he is equal with God. And these are, uh, these are low Christologies which are heretical. These people have taken the words Romans chapter 1 verse 4 where it is written However, Paul states that Jesus was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. It looks as if because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he was declared as the son of God. Okay. So, but this word is not required to be interpreted that way. This word can be interpreted as Jesus was declared as a son of God through his resurrection, which means he's already the son of already the son of God, and he has been pronounced as a son of God or declared as a son of God. It, it is not saying he was adopted and he became son of God, but he was already son of God, and then he was declared as the son of God. So, uh, because in when we read the scripture, we know that scripture does not contradict itself. And uh, 
the scripture says that he, Jesus was begotten by the Father in eternity from eternity past. Forever we, we have the eternal Father, which means we have it, uh, there is an eternal Son. So, and as John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is co-eternal with God. So this um, low Christology cannot be uh, used for Jesus Christ. And another place where, another way where Apostle Paul speaks about the identity of Jesus Christ is by introducing uh, a new word that is called uh, kurios, K-Y-R-I-O-S, kurios, which means Lord in Greek, master. Kurios means Lord in Greek. The same word has been used by Jewish people uh, when they, as they address God the Father. So by using this word and referring this word to Jesus, Apostle Paul is preaching to the Jewish community that Jesus is God himself. And then he is using the same word with the Greeks and Romans. For them, they call, they call uh, Caesar alone is the Lord. And uh, if you read uh, the Gospels, book of Acts ends with Apostle Paul teaching Jesus as the Lord in Rome itself. In other words, Apostle Paul was preaching, Caesar is no more Lord, but Jesus is the Lord. This is a political statement. And that's one of the reasons the Christians were being persecuted. So when Apostle Paul called Jesus as Lord, the Greeks and the Romans, they understood in two ways. Number one, Caesar is no more Lord, but Jesus is the Lord. And number two thing is, Caesar is considered to be the son of God. And he is saying, Caesar is no more the son of God, but Jesus is the son of God. That is the very reason, purposefully, Apostle Paul was using this very word, curious. And he used this word 230 times in his epistles. So here also, Jesus, Apostle Paul was recognizing and speaking about the divinity of Jesus Christ. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, it says, In Christ the fullness of deity resides in bodily form. Nobody has really written such an explicit statement. But Apostle Paul says, the fullness of God can be seen in Jesus Christ, in a body like you and me. So uh, he did not look at Jesus as the mere, mere humans, but he has looked, he looked Jesus as the divine, the God himself, the second person of the Trinity. So Apostle Paul speaks very strongly about the divinity of Jesus Christ. And we can find interestingly in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, uh, 5 to 11, uh, where uh, the high Christology and as well as low Christology can be to, to an extent uh, to, uh, can be brought together. Okay, we are not believing in the low Christology, we are believing in high Christology where we say Jesus is existing even before the incarnation. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of born servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. <coughs> Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you read the first half of this uh, para, sorry, the scripture portion, it says Jesus is, I mean, uh, he is being in the form of God. He did not consider it to be God. He is being equal with God, but he humbled himself. So it speaks about the divinity of Jesus Christ and the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. And then in the second half, he says, 
God has highly exalted him. Unlike uh, the adoptionist or the low Christology people say, he is God. Jesus is already divine. The first half, in the first half, it has been established, and then in the second half, it is said, since he is divine and he is highly exalted by the Father. That's that is what the Christology of Apostle Paul. And another thing we can find uh, in uh, Apostle Paul's writing and in his Christology is, in fact, the reality is Paul's Christology is incarnational Christology. His Christology is surrounded, uh, surrounded it's, uh, it's all around the incarnation of Jesus Christ. If you read uh, the Gospels clearly and especially the teachings and preachings of Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter, we find uh, one interesting thing that is Peter always preached about the fulfillment of the prophecy. And he says, Jesus is the prophet who was, Jesus is the one who was prophesied in the Old Testament. And the, those prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's what Peter says. But when it comes to Apostle Paul, he entirely finds a new thing. And he says about a mystery. God has spoken to our fathers in various times, in various ways. But in the last days, God spoke to us through his son. Apostle Paul says the mystery has been revealed which was hidden from ages to ages. Now it is revealed to, God revealed it to his holy, holy apostles, that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. If you read the writings of Paul, we'll find the word mystery in so many places. He is not looking at the prophecy fulfilled. He is looking at the one who was existing before the foundation of the world along with the father and he has taken the human form and he was died, buried and resurrected and he is ascended to be seated at the right hand of God. The same thing we can find in the two scriptures we read also in Colossians chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse uh, uh, 15 to 19 and uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 11. Colossians chapter 1, it speaks so highly about who he was even before the foundation of the world. And then he brings it to the incarnation. And that's what we can find in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11. So the Christology of Apostle Paul is centered around the incarnational incarnation of Jesus Christ. So we can consider his Christology as uh, the Christology, incarnational Christology. And another thing is, the Christology of Apostle Paul is a cosmic Christology. This Christology is included uh, includes entire creation. Romans chapter eight verse eighteen to nineteen we can find we can find uh, for I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation sub was subjected to the futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Jesus Christ, the entire world is a new thing. In the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, all things have been made new. All things have passed away. Entire creation also is looking for the renewal. Uh, so in Christ, Apostle Paul is look, looking the renewal of humanity, the renewal of entire creation. So that is going to happen in Jesus Christ. So the Christology of Jesus is the cosmic Christology it is in which entire universe is um, <coughs> involved. And in this, uh, we talk so much about universal reconciliation. The universe and the earth also is going to be renewed and we are going to experience a new earth and a new heaven in Jesus Christ. So the Christology of Paul is a cosmic Christology. And then Apostle Paul also brings a reconciliation uh, sense of Christology. 
that is in genesis we can find that entire humanity was lost and in jesus all humanity has been reconciled in that that's why apostle paul uses the analogy of adam and the last adam in the in adam all humanity was lost in the last adam jesus christ all humanity was brought together and uh, he writes in colossians chapter 1 verse 20 where he says through him god was pleased to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven so uh, the uh, when it comes to paul as he looked at jesus he is looking at a person in whom the humanity is going to be reconciled in him the universe is going to be restored and reconciled it is a cosmic as well as uh, a reconciling kind of uh, christology in his body itself which we are going to see further and in fact apostle according to apostle paul the christology is nothing but soteriology soteriology is the study of salvation study of jesus christ itself is the study of salvation for apostle paul uh his christology his soteriology that is he was mainly interested in what uh, jesus death and resurrection brought about for humanity and uh, which is forgiveness of sins justification access to god reconciliation salvation redemption freedom peace from god glorification grace holiness holiness and eternal life and etc <coughs> <coughs> Paul always focused on the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what they have accomplished for us and in one place he writes if Jesus was not resurrected and we are still in our sins and in romans he writes uh, uh, you know we who are sinners were been justified through his death how much more we shall be saved through his resurrection so when he talks about us completely apostle paul is completely focusing on death burial and resurrection and in fact he says very astounding statement saying like i was crucified with christ buried with christ and resurrected from dead with christ everything that happened and for all people all their lives are centered around death burial and resurrection of jesus christ for apostle paul so his christology is completely uh, enveloped or it is completely uh, uh, what we we'll call intertwined with the soteriology that uh, it's about salvation and um, and apostle paul he speaks about uh, one of the unique oh one minute uh apostle paul is quite uh, one thing we find uh, in apostle paul's teaching he is not very much interested in uh, talking about what all happened in the life of jesus he is not very much interested in talking about the miracles that jesus performed and he is not very much interested in talking about all the teachings of the by jesus teachings of jesus also he is very much focused on the person of jesus christ that is he is the son of god and he is co-eternal with god in him only we have our salvation so he is always speaking about the about jesus who is mysterious who is uh, he he is not uh, talking about the kind of uh, explanation which apostle peter and other disciples were giving and uh, uh apostle paul also brings about uh, his uh, apostle paul's christology is also connected with the vicarious life of jesus christ vicariousness we find the words in adam all humanity was lost but in jesus entire humanity was uh, reconciled unto the lord this is the this is the kind of analogy apostle paul brings and nobody else no other disciples have ever brought uh, uh, these kind of analogies but apostle paul brings that in doing that what is he doing is if uh, uh, adam is representing humanity jesus is representing humanity even much more than that okay if uh, in adam all are dead 
even Adam was in Jesus Christ. That's what Apostle Paul uh, writes about, writes actually. So if Adam represents humanity, Jesus represents even much more. Uh, and uh, we can, where we can see the human nature of Jesus Christ himself. So Paul con contrasts the destiny that the first Adam brought to humanity, which is sin, death, condemnation, and obedience. And the destiny that Christ has now, uh, Christ as the new Adam has made possible to us, that is grace, justification, righteousness, obedience, and Jesus being 100% God and 100% man, he is mediating for us. He is not just mediating with the words, but being 100% God and 100% man, he is mediating. He is representing humanity to God and he is representing God to the humanity. You all know the Old Testament figure of the priest. Priest wears 12, uh, he has 12 stones on his robe. He, on each stone, that each tribe of Israel was written. So as he goes to the presence of God, he is representing the 12 tribes of Israel in God's presence. And as he returns, uh, as he turns towards the people, he will be representing the picture of God and he, is exp he will be expressing the message of God to uh, people. So in the same way, Jesus being 100% God and 100% man, not just by his action, by his very being, by his very being, he is mediating God to humanity and humanity to God. So here Apostle Paul is talking about the humanity of Jesus Christ. In the first we have seen how strongly he was talking about the divinity of Jesus Christ. Here he is talking about humanity of Jesus. And we can find Apostle Paul writing in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, God and men, that is the man Jesus Christ. Paul says Jesus is still a man. He is still mediating for us. There is a man in heaven, that is Jesus. So as Jesus went to the uh, heaven, he has taken entire humanity with us because he is our federal head. And uh, he has taken us and made us seat at the right hand of the Father. That's why Apostle Paul says, your life is hidden in Christ with, with God. Sorry, your life is hidden in God with Christ. And you have been seated in the heavenly places. That's what Apostle Paul writes. Because he has clearly seen Jesus being a man, he was ascended to heaven and he is mediating for us. And one, one interesting thing we find is Paul does not base his hope of resurrection on the Old Testament scriptures. We can find a resurrection, eternal life. We can find so many things in book of Isaiah and book of uh, uh, Ezekiel in so many places we find. But Apostle Paul, he does not put his hope on any of these words and he does not put his hope on Greek understanding of uh, immortality of the soul whichever attains the greatest knowledge how uh, the soul will be living forever that is the Greek understanding of immortality and at the same time he does not put his confidence on the Jewish eschatological uh, expectation that is at the last days God is going to raise the righteous people from the dead and they are going to live uh, in the millennial kingdom forever, these kind of st things we can find in the Old Testament. And he does not put his faith in that, but he completely puts his faith and complete, completely based his hope on the very foundational belief and teaching that is Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So uh, he pl places his hope upon, upon the resurrection of Jesus. And he says, as Jesus rose again from the dead, we are going to be raised again from the dead. If Jesus not was Jesus was not raised from the dead, what all we are teaching is lie. And uh, we are the people who do not have any hope. We can find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 completely. He talks about the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, all our faith and our life is based and founded upon the very fact that is Jesus rose again from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus is the center and foundation for all our Christian hope. That is the Christology Apostle Paul has. 
And one more interesting thing we can find is, uh, uh, have you ever, ever heard about Christ mysticism? Uh, which uh, these are te some technical words uh, we may find, we may, uh, uh, which are very rare we, we, get, we get to hear. But Christ mysticism is nothing but saying, uh, like uh, Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus Christ is living in us. And his incarnation is not complete by the resurrection and ascension. But he is still living in us through the Holy Spirit. I, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And God, Christ started a good work in us. And he says, he who started a good work in us will also bring it to the completion to the uh, by the day of the Lord. You know, you can find it in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. So Christ is in us. He is working in us. He is working through us. And he made us his body. And we are the body of Christ. The, this is a mystical teaching, mystical belief. Uh, that Christianity brings and in fact uh, very strongly taught by Apostle Paul and uh, touched by Apostle John, especially in John chapter 17, we find Jesus prays to the Father, we may be in him, they may be in us, uh, so that we may be one with him. So the inter um, interpenetration or we can mutual dwelling, which Apostle Paul, sorry, Apostle John says the same thing Apostle Paul writes here. The Christ is in us. The main theme of book of Ephesians is we are in Christ. And the main theme of book of Colossians is Christ in us. So we are in him, Christ in us. This is similar picture to John chapter 17, the mutual indwelling. So this is a mystical uh, kind of thing, we, which we may not be 100% able to explain it, but we are 100% able to experience it. Uh, so uh, this is the mystical life of uh, some mystical life of Jesus Christ at this present age in the um, in his body uh, in in all his faithful believers. So that is about Christ mysticism. This is what Apostle Paul sees. Christ ministry is not over, but he is still working in us uh, through the Holy Spirit. And. Uh, uh, well, last in last an interesting thing I would like to bring to uh, your notice is we find it which we find in Second Corinthians chapter five verse sixteen, uh, where he says, "Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him does no longer." Apostle Paul is not interested in knowing Christ according to the flesh. Which means according to the it can be according to the reason it can be according to uh, the encounter he had with the resurrected Jesus it can be be uh, by directly listening to him or hearing him or anything but he want to know him according to the spirit and one in one more thing we find in the same uh, letter to, sorry in First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse three uh, that is uh, for I delivered to you first of all which. I also received that Christ died for us according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he was rose again the third day according to the scripture. Christ wants to know Christ. Sorry, Paul wants to know Christ according to the scriptures. He is not writing, he is not putting his faith on the resurrection of Jesus because he just had an encounter with Jesus the other day, but he put his faith in Jesus according to the scripture. Jesus was dead according to the scripture, rose again from buried and rose again from the dead according to the scripture. And he doesn't want to believe in any physical uh, proofs, but he wants to believe completely, depend and put his faith on the spiritual experience uh, he is having. And uh, completely he wants to put his faith on the scripture's witness. This is the, uh, this is the Christ Apostle Paul is believing. The Christ of Apostle Paul is by the Spirit. The Christ of the Apostle Paul is of the Scriptures. So this is the Christology of Apostle Paul. So once we just go through what all we have seen, the, according to Apostle Paul, uh, Christ exists before the creation of the world. Uh, he is God and he is firstborn of all creation. He has preeminence in everything. 
And number two thing, he has preeminence through everything and through his resurrection, it has been declared to humanity. And Apostle Paul uses the word Lord, which, uh, which, de which denotes or which speaks about his divinity, as well as uh, he is the king over all uh, humanity and powers, and Caesar is not the king, but Jesus Christ is the king. And the fullness of God dwells in, Apostle, sorry, in Jesus Christ. Here, Apostle Paul speaks about the divinity of Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, the next thing is Apostle Paul's theology is, so Christology is incarnational Christology because he, he doesn't speak about fulfillment of the prophecies, but he speaks about incarnation, which is a mystical union, uh, which is a mystery. Uh, the uh, through sorry which is an act through which the mystery of god has been revealed to us and then apostle paul's christology is the cosmic christology in his christology in his christ all humanity is hoping all humanity is indwelling and entire humanity is going to find uh, the salvation and uh, redemption and entire humanity was made new creation in jesus christ and uh, Paul's Christology is soteriology. His Christology is completely based upon the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he speaks completely about uh, the benefits uh, or the implications of death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, lastly, uh, sorry, second last thing is uh, uh, Jesus uh, is made. Jesus is hundred percent man. That's why he brings. The analogy of Adam and uh, Jesus, the first Adam and the last Adam. So if Adam is representing humanity, Jesus is representing humanity much more. And then uh, we have a man in heaven that is Jesus Christ, which is talking about the humanity of Jesus. So he spoke about divinity of Jesus uh, and then he spoke about the humanity of Jesus. He is 100% man and he is 100% uh, human. And then... Uh, uh, we can find, and the Christology is not ended with Jesus being ascended to heaven, uh, but the Christology continues as Jesus is living in and through us in our daily life. So the Christ, his Christology is not just conceptual, but it is an experiential thing in the life of each and every believer. And Apostle Paul, he doesn't want to know Christ according to the flesh, but his Christ is according to the scripture and according to the spirit. So this is what Apostle Paul, we find about Christ in uh, Apostle Paul's uh, writing and in his ministry. Uh, if you have any questions or doubts or you want to comment or add, please feel free to uh, do that. Yes, sir. Sir, sir, I have a very simple question, sir. Yes, please. The Jews, the Jews expected the Messiah, na? Hmm. Uh, then when Christ came, they did not accept him as the Messiah. Yes. Yes. So they, they were looking. They, what did they believe about Jesus? Sir? What is the what did the Jews believe regarding Jesus? Yeah, uh, so there are so many people expecting uh, for Messiah, especially during the 150 years of Jesus. I mean, Jesus was there uh, 70 years before and after, like, you know, like 150 years. During this 150 years, there were so many people who came and claimed that they were the Messiahs. Okay. And these Jewish people were expecting completely uh, for the Messiah who would redeem them from the bondage of the Romans. Who is going to establish the kingdom? In fact, the disciples of Jesus Christ himself, in himself were believing and expecting that uh, the Messiah would redeem them from the power of Romans. That is, you know, this is after the resurrection of Jesus, not even before. After the resurrection of Jesus also, the disciples were asking Jesus, Lord, when you come this time, are you going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? You remember those words? And uh, Jesus nudges them and he does not answer uh, those questions. Okay, so these people were looking for uh, uh, a powerful, a political army-based uh, uh, messiah who is going to redeem them. 
and that is the very reason in the year uh, 65 AD 65 AD 6 not 65 68 i guess AD 68 they accepted a man called Simon Bakogba this man Simon Bakogba is a very uh, what we call charismatic person and a very uh, man with a great uh, skill in fighting so he brought people and he fought against rome can you believe such a small country israel fighting against rome and he they are keeping their borders for two years they maintain their borders for two years and people used to cut their hands and fingers to show their allegiance uh, you know their commitment towards simon bakagba and they were fighting with him and they fought against romans for two years they kept their peace and then they lost even today even today they are expecting for a messiah who is going to be a political messiah but in fact the message of jesus is quite powerful jesus and his uh, <clears throat> ministry his death and resurrection are, are completely political and they got victory over the rome which which in history we have to see okay and god is going to accomplish establishing his kingdom uh, in completely in the days to come we are going to see the fullness so but one thing is basically jewish people were looking for a messiah who is going to be political they might have read uh, uh, isaiah uh, isaiah till chapter 48 only they did not read from 48 to 53 so till 48 it speaks about jesus coming as a king and then it speaks about jesus being uh, tortured and uh, his uh, his service as a servant so they have taken only part of it the rest of it was not taken <coughs> so that's the very reason i guess uh, they did not accept jesus as the messiah and definitely uh, he is uh, he was not keeping the sabbath according to their uh, their ways and uh, he was been crucified on the cross so they, they made it very difficult for others also not to believe and one single statement i would like to say if you remember Uh, Jesus saying about uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. If you read the con uh, the context teaches us these people were not believing not because they were not convinced to believe. They are not believing because they don't want to believe. <laughs> And that's why many places it is written. Jesus, it is uh, it says Jesus knowing their heart, he said this. So. they are not inter- it is not because they are not convinced to believe it is they don't want to believe just like uh, see this man um, aw tozer says the gates of hell were closed from the uh, inside so sir, sir one last question yes, sir, sir today what about do, do, do the jews of today accept jesus divinity no still they don't now but uh, at the same time there is a great revival taking place among the jews a lot of jews were turning to jesus we hear we hear about messianic christians have you heard about this group messianic christians these are people who are believing in jesus but still they continue the jewish uh, traditions because a lot of things uh, uh, were commanded to them to observe so they were keeping the uh, commandment and continuing it and uh, but they put their faith in jesus christ the big group of people uh, you know a revival is taking place actually among the jews also and in fact if you read um, uh, romans chapter 11 it is a very interesting uh, uh, chapter where apostle paul writes about uh, jews and gentiles about wild olives and uh, olives and where he says if jewish rejection made salvation come to gentiles and their acceptance is going to make the salvation even much more powerful so for example because of the reje- rejection 100 people came to faith if they accept 1000 people are going to come that's what apostle paul writes and he keeps his faith thank you sir any more questions yes uncle 
unmute yourself yes it is unmuted yeah uh, i think you said that jesus was uh, uh first created mm-hmm. something in like that uh, that is uh, jeho witness believes jesus is the uh, jesus was created first and then through jesus all things are created which is a heretical teaching yeah, yeah but uh, of course i know oh you know it is uh, they believe that that he was created uh first born also you mentioned i think you said that yes uh is there any i think there is a confusion isn't it how should we look at uh, those words first born of all creation mm. is he actually first born of all creation ah uh, no 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 that's a, that's a, uh, there is a uh, we need to read the original text uncle the greek text and all we have to read when it comes to Eng- uh, english we always run short of uh, terminology uh, terms actual actually that is the very reason we use the word begot jesus was begotten by the father okay so when it comes to the word uh, first born when it comes to this the wo- same word begotten was used the word begotten most of the times we think which is uh, like you know i am there and my have my daughter who came out of me and there was a time my daughter was not there this is this is biological understanding this is what happens among the humans so there is a term called uh, i don't know if you heard this this is called anthropomorphism anthropos means anthropos means man morphism means uh, picturing okay making god more like man whatever the qualities we find in man we try to put them on god that is called anthropomorphism okay this is a technical for word for idolatry also whatever the qualities we feel we put it on god for example our father gets angry when he when we do something wrong so we project it on god and we say god gets angry when we do something wrong may be different god may be thinking god may want to help us to learn something else you know we cannot put all our characteristics our qualities on god that is anthropomorphism so the, similarly when we talk about begot we 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 do our biological process and we put it on god and say there was a time when sun was not there and we say that god created him so if son was not there how can the father be father from eternity mm-hmm. so we find, we we love, we believe that we have a eternal father that means there is an eternal son so uh, so we when we bring this biological understanding we get confused but the same word begot which means unique unique means there is nothing of such sort so the relationship between the father and the son is such a relationship there is nothing of such sort which means he is eternally begotten and he is eternally begetting so that is what christianity teaches i know we sometimes we find it very difficult to take it um so but still it is a mystery we all are going to learn throughout it and anything yeah okay I think Mr. Surya Murthy wants to ask you something. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, 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 Pravin, sir, one more, one more question. Yes. The the case for Christ's divinity is overwhelming. Yes. Everything is supernatural. Yes. Why then do Jehovah's Witness not accept the divinity of Christ? I said no, uncle. The same problem, Jehovah. You know, the same subject we were studying previously. um uh, jehova witness they are not able to accept uh, the divinity of jesus christ because of two reasons 
Number one is they want to become very, they want to hold on to the monotheism very strongly. But their monotheism is one God, one person. That is called monad monotheism. What Christianity teaches is Trinitarian monotheism. God is three persons, but one being. That is Trinitarian monotheism. These uh, Jehovah Witness, uh, these are people who came from Arianism. In the early church, that's called Arianism, who said Jesus is not God. Okay. And these are the people very highly influenced by Greek philosophy. It is because of their belief and uh, roots in Greek philosophy, they are not able to accept the divinity of Jesus Christ. God can be either one or three. How can there be one and three? Or unity and diversity. We say about oneness and then distinction, right? How these three, three things can be come, can come, come together? They were not able to understand it. We have an easy word, university, which is taken from unity and as, from, as well as from diversity. And we made the word university. It is one place, unified place, where distinct subjects are studied. That's an example we can take. Okay, so these people, they have completely given into Greek philosophy. That's why they were not able to accept the divinity of Jesus, number one. And number two thing is, as I told you, uh, anthropomorphism. We put our, whatever the characteristics, whatever we, as, as a human experience, we project them on God. And we say God also is like this. And that is the very reason they were not able to accept the divinity of Jesus. Yeah, we have three more minutes. Yes, Vanessa. So, uh, in in the end, in the end, is that we have to have faith in God, whether it is uh, just God the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. We have to have faith in God. Uh, no, Vanessa, not like that. Um, we are believing in God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you if you separate them, there is no God existing actually. Okay, that's why Apostle Paul, in all his writings, he writes, you know, blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everywhere he speaks about God, he brings Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. We are believing in God, the Father and the Holy Spirit, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And in John, uh, Apostle John writes in First John. Whoever does not believe that Jesus Christ is God who came in flesh is not of God. So we are believing in Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. That is the very unique faith of Christianity and that's what we have to believe. It is not about randomly believing in any God. There are all people believe randomly except it is some kind of God. That is not what we are teaching about. That's why uh, all the writings of Paul, they start with this. Blessed be the God, the Father, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And benediction also we give. The love of the Father, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, communion of the Holy Spirit. So three persons and one God. That's what makes difference. Otherwise, uh, all people believe something or other. I believe in God, but what difference it makes. Believing Jesus is the Son of God who rose again from the dead. When the moment we say Son of God, Father comes, right? And uh, Holy Spirit comes. So that's what Christian faith is. And I would like to encourage you, if you got time, if you get time, please uh, Google for Nicene Creed. I guess uh, Pastor Dan is going to teach about Nicene Creed and Constantinople Creed uh, in the next sessions he's going to teach in Bible study. I would like to encourage you to read that. That is what, what we should be believing as Christians is mentioned in those. So, so shall we close our Bible study then? Can I request Mr. Poppins to close it with a prayer? Yes. yes. Gracious Father, our loving Lord, Lord, we bow our heads, Father, at the close of 
this study. Thank you, Lord, in the hustle and bustle of life for giving us, Father, the willingness to pause, to listen to your word, to learn. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, to be frank, there are many things, there's a mystery to human understanding. Yet, Lord, we want to thank you, Father, for your grace and for your mercies for us. Lord, thank you, Father, for opening our hearts and minds to understand, Lord, about Christianity, to understand who Christ is and the relationship of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Lord, open our hearts and minds. Fill us, Lord, with a good understanding so that we grow into a deeper relationship with you. With you. Lord, grant us the faith to trust in you. And even as we pray this, Father, we pray for the many, many individuals and the many, many organizations across the world, Lord, who find it tough to understand the divinity of Christ. Lord, only you can help them. Lord, we ask that you will extend your grace to them. And in the right time and in the right way, surely you will call them and induct them also as your full-fledged children. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for our pastor Pravi and for the hard work and for his willingness to share his, his uh, understanding with us. Thank you, Lord. Be with all of us, Father, and bless all our members and all those, Lord, who are eager to learn. Lord, you will call many more. Thank you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks for joining. And uh, you have a good evening. And uh, we all see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.